here we are. I'm starting to see some participants. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to uh, International Virtual Studio. I'm gonna wait for other people to come and to connect with us, but uh, for the few of you who are here, can you please give me feedback if you can hear me or see me properly? Thank you. Okay. Hi, your radio. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Okay. We are uh, waiting for Professor Montini to enter the direct. We're just going to wait. Okay. So, in the meanwhile, um, I'm going to present you um, Virtual Studio for uh, one of you uh, who entered the first time, uh, one of our direct of International Virtual Studio. Uh, I'm going to say that uh, Virtual Studio is our interdisciplinary uh, online project uh, designed, promoted and coordinated by uh, using a campus cultural activities. Uh, in collaboration with your radio and Chico Maggio, which I say hi to them today and I thank for being here. Um, we are waiting for uh, Professor Massimiliano Montini, who's a professor of European Union Law and Sustainable Development Law. And he is also uh, the scientific coordinator of uh, the Europe Direct at the University of Siena. And he's co-director um, he's co-director of the R4S, uh, the Regulation of uh, Sustainability Research Group, and he's also uh, the vice chair at the ELGA, the Ecological and Law uh, Government uh, Association. Um, we are waiting for him. Let me check. I'll send an invitation to him. I wanted also to remind to you that uh, International Virtual Studio is a week appointment. So after today, we're going to see you uh, next Thursday. And you can find uh, our videos on uh, UCNA Campus um, EG account, Instagram account, and you can also find our directs on the YouTube channel of the University of Siena. Uh, please, if you have any comments or any questions that you want to ask, you have the comment section down below. Okay. Okay, I think he's joining us. There we are. Okay. Let's wait for him. Okay, he's connecting with us. Perfect. I'm sorry, but I'm having and oh, he refused to enter. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Perfect. Let me check again. Okay. Let me see if I can do it it another way. <laughs> I'm reading the comments of your radio, Sienna. 
he's a friend of mine who's writing. Hi, Mattia. I know it's you. Okay. Okay. Let's try again. Okay, he says it's connected. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Okay. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Can you? Now I can hear you. I can see okay. you. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I can hear you and I can see now you it's, properly. It be right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I was actually, um, you know, presenting you, Professor, and I said that. You are a professor in European Union law and sustainable uh, development law at the University of Siena. Um, today, um, we are actually using you because you are the director of uh, the RFOS, the Regulation Sustainability Research Group, and you are also uh, vice chair at the ELGA, the Ecological Law and Governments Association. So, um, the main theme of today is a post-COVID-19 ecological law and governance approach. Uh, based on this title, Professor, uh, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, uh, what are the data and the information that we are collecting now about our ecological situation during this 19 pandemic situation? Yeah. Uh, so what we are trying to do, uh, obviously, is to look at the crisis uh, of COVID-19 from our perspective. Uh, we have been uh, launching our global platform uh, four years ago, um, the Ecological Law and Governance Association. Uh, this started in 2016 uh, with um, a declaration. We first had our gathering in Oslo. And so we have a, do a founding document, which is called the Oslo Manifesto, um, dated uh, 2016, that uh, everybody can find on our website, elgaworld.org. And uh, obviously, this is our starting point. It's, it's, a, it's a network. So obviously, nowadays, with the current um, emergency, COVID emergency, we are uh, connecting with all our uh, partners and colleagues and friends around the world to try and share um, ideas and share experience as, as we usually do. So we try mm -hmm. to uh, try to see whether our messages can be useful for the restart after the COVID, try to use uh, obviously the scientific data, but also the um, social sciences uh, reflections that are appearing all over the world on these issues. Um, during uh, the last uh, encounters with the professors and during the last International Virtual Studio Live, we have uh, discussed uh, mostly about uh, uh, the uh, short-term um, consequences of this pandemic situation which could be mobility, which could be the social changing, which is actually now. But um, about our ecological and sustainable situation, what are the long-term consequences that we will face after the end of this pandemic situation? Yes, of course. We are now all uh, worried and concerned about the current um you know, uh, visible uh, consequences. Mm. We are all more or less blocked at home. We have to reduce our normal activities. Uh, the, the crucial question nowadays that we should think um, about is, should we restart in the same way? I think this is the most interesting question. Uh, so we hopefully have a bit of time now. Everybody has a bit of time more than, than usual. Okay. Uh, and so it's time to think, uh, both at the global perspective and at the local, at each one's uh, life. So do we want to restart in the same way? Do we think that everything we were doing was correct, both individually and collectively? So I think it's the right time to pose this kind of question. I think it might be the time to seriously think about a more sustainable society, about a better ways to consume and produce our goods, uh, about a better way to produce our energy, 
and 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 to uh, to live differently. This doesn't mean to completely change our um, lifestyle, but maybe to consider, for example, a different approach between humans and nature, which is one of the issues we are dealing with. Um, so try to have a more balanced approach. So um, one, one, our, one of our keywords is that we should um, um, have a start a, a, a time of responsibilities. So try to consider our responsibilities towards nature and towards the ecosystems, which are the basis for life. Uh, and and not but life of all um, living beings. So I think this maybe looks a bit um, strange to some people, but it's actually uh, if we want to restart in a more sustainable way, uh, this might be a very to rethink, as I was saying. Okay, so uh, what you are suggesting now is to think and to rethink a new paradigm of for the um, ecological approach uh, to law and governments. Is it correct? Yes, um, we, we we talk about an ecological approach. Um, ecological approach means that uh, we want to uh, put first the integrity of ecosystems. Uh, if you look at the way humans have been developing in the last um, 50 years and this has been a, a story of uh, domination and over exploitation of natural resources we now uh, are in the middle of a very big climate crisis uh, and this is something that everybody is well aware of we are in the middle of a biodiversity crisis um, we are in a situation where uh, we, we don't have equity around the world uh, and, and we have a lot of inequalities and poverty which are increasing. So all these should lead us to the conclusion that our um, economic model, which is based on the, on, the, and on the dominance approach, is probably not the right one. So we need to... Um, And the way we um, deal with our relationship with nature, with our other living beings. If we don't start with this um, underpinning, with this with this philosophical foundation, I think we we miss the the, the reason why we need to change. And and the change will occur anyway because we live in the middle of the crisis. Things will be different in the future. Um, so I think it's time to do it uh, properly in a conscious way rather than being forced to change at some point by the uh, natural events. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the questions that uh, I wanted to ask to you is that we, uh, during the last uh, meetings uh, on on International Virtual Studio, we have talked about uh, even the, the worst uh, consequences uh, that um, you know, that this pandemic situation could have and could lead our society to. But um, I started to think, is it possible that this post-COVID situation, could could it be seen uh, as an opportunity for re to think and rethink uh, the socio-economic models? Uh, and even, of course, based on uh, the, you know, the ecological issues and matters, uh, Okay. I'm having trouble in seeing the professor. Can you see him? Because I I can't. I lost him. Oh. Unfortunately, the connection is sometimes not very good. Sorry, professor. I lost you <laughs> for a minute. Okay. Um, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you see me now? Me, me too. No. Oh, oh, okay. Perfect. Mm -mm. Okay. Lost again. Mm. 
Unfortunately, I have lost him again. Um, okay. Uh, professor, here you are. Okay. Give it a bit. Okay. Hmm. Oops. Professor. No. Oops. Lost him again. I think he's having trouble with, uh, you know, the internet connection could happen during these days. Okay. Um, while we are waiting for the professor to join us again, to say, okay. oh, he left. Oh my God. Okay. Let's see if we can connect with him back again. So sorry, guys, but you know, it's uh, we are in an emergency situation, so these things could happen. Okay, here we are. Yes, maybe. Okay, while we are waiting for the professor, I wanted to remember to, um, sorry if I, I am misspelling it, but Sarv J-N-Y. This is not the first time actually that we're doing studium uh, in, or direct lives in English. This is actually the third because three weeks ago, we, you know, we started the International Virtual Studium, which is a weekly appointment. So if you want to listen to us, you can join us every week, every Thursday at 6 p.m. on these channels. Unfortunately, Professor is having is still having troubles. Okay. Where is he right now? Where are you? Okay, let me see. I'm so sorry. I don't know where he is. Let me see if I invite him. Okay, they're telling me that he's changing the internet lines, so He'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, Sarv, JNY. Yes, I'm sorry. You lost the first two, but you can check them out in a few days on the YouTube channel of uh, the University of Siena because uh, we are, you know, uploading all the old live videos uh, on the YouTube channel. Okay. Tell us a joke. I'm not good at jokes. I can smile. That's it. Okay. 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 I changed the, the room. <laughs> yes. Okay. Perfect. So I Perfect. hope here is a bit better. Yes. Okay. Um, let's, you know, just join back our conversation. Okay. Okay. Um, the question that I have asked you before all of this was that um, we have talked, uh, we have discussed uh, with uh, the other professors before you um, the short term situation, the short term uh, um, consequences and uh, um, even the worst consequences that we could face uh, after this quarantine emergency situation. But uh, um, I have thought about something the post-COVID period, um, could it be seen as an opportunity for 
the rethinking of the social economic models uh, and not just uh, as the end of something that destroyed us yeah of course um i think we should we should have an, an optimistic approach i think we should have a it sounds strange because now we are all a bit somehow depressed being at home, you know, being away from our traditional yeah. social connections. But I think we should see this as an opportunity. Many people have uh, made a parallel between the current situation and the post-war um, situation after Second World War, where, of course, people had to uh, restart their economies in most countries almost completely. And this is a similar situation. I think it's, it's, it might be a big change. It might be the big change we were waiting for, because we have been talking about this for many years. Uh, yesterday was the, you know, the 50th anniversary of the yes. Earth Charter, uh, and uh, the, the Earth Day and, and mm -hmm. all that has followed that, you know, and in, in the beginning of the 70s, uh, another big crisis occurred with the oil, big oil crisis at the beginning of the 70s. This was the first time that international institutions uh, started mm -hmm. to act. It was the, the, the time that the European Union started to act. So it's about 50 years that we have been talking about that, about the limits of our economic model. And, and, and recently, we have a lot of evidence with the climate crisis, as I was saying, and with other um, you know, environmental and, and, and ecological crises. So this might be the situation where you know, we start thinking, OK, what, what should we change? Because I think we shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't have the idea that everything can be started in the same way. So for sure, we, we need to change something. And we need to do that with a certain enthusiasm. And I think we need to engage particularly young people to come out with new ideas, with new opportunities. And I think this should be the way it is. It shouldn't be seen as something we lose, but actually as an opportunity we have to, to do things in a different way, maybe making a better use of technologies. And as you can see now, we have the opportunity to do these kind of meetings. We still have a lot of connection problems, which means <laughs> that, you know, things are not perfect yet, but at least we can have, you know, a broad connection. We can connect people. We maybe couldn't be there if it was a physical meeting. So I think we should try to, to you know, to work on that and, and, and to be you know, to be proactive in the change, because I think what will make a difference, it will be, you know, some people will be proactive and be part of the change. Some other people, as usually in history, will just, you know, uh, be a, a, a passive approach and just have to mm -hmm. cope with the consequences of, of change. And I think we should try to be, you know, proactive and enthusiastic because, you know, it, it's probably a different time, a new time, and we should be part of it should be resilient too we could say yeah, exactly. it should be um, resilient. we have uh, actually a question um more more than a question is actually you know a statement um you radio Sena is uh, writing the paradox is the countries who polluted the most uh, are those who are less um attentive to the climate crisis could COVID-19 be a real engine? For instance, the USA aren't fully persuaded uh, of its urgency. Yes, it's true. I was expecting a question about the USA <laughs> because clearly this is, this is a crucial example. It's a crucial example of the fact that uh, if you look at the, you know, the way that the you know the president of the U.S. is is the you know the the most uh, evident example of the old approach I would say of the traditional approach of the oil approach of the carbon approach. But of course, uh, I would say this is just um, it should be seen as a person that is defending the past or is defending a past approach is not certainly projected in the future. So obviously we are not uh, making here political considerations, but if we look at that, if you try to look at that in an objective way, uh, you should see that, of course, at the top of the US government now, uh, there is a very conservative, a very old approach. On the other side, if you look at the local 
examples in the US at the level of local communities, at the level of, of single states, which are part of the of the United States of America. I think of, you know, about California, for example, mm. as has always been proactive in environmental issues. These countries and, and these local communities are actually part of, of a broad network of people who are doing something to change the world. And so we should look at the positive dimension. Of course, I have a lot of friends in the United States which are very unhappy about the, you know, the federal governments. But, but, and of course, it is that. But uh, we, if, you, if you place that in, in an historical perspective, this might be you know, just the, the end of, of, of an old paradigm. And, and, and then maybe other people will come with a new approach. And this might take some time, but uh, for sure there are you know, grassroots um, communities and people and a lot of initiatives. So we have to look at the positive side. Okay. And, and also maybe I would like to say something more about before the interruption, I, I was about to explain uh, yes. the difference between yes, our ecological approach and the traditional environmental approach. This is particularly relevant in the, in the legal and institutional dimension, which is my main area of work, although yes. our as association has a, an interdisciplinary approach. Um, the difference is that um, when we speak about an ecological approach, we speak about a, a, an interconnection, as I was saying, between humans and nature. And so we protect ecosystems because we consider that humans are part of ecosystem. So we have a, 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 a sort of ecocentric approach, but humans are embedded into the ecosystems. So we protect the ecosystem because we are part of it. So we don't see a separate protection of humans, for example, through human rights protection, we don't see as separated from environmental protection. And in law, so far, you had very different areas. So, for example, human rights, where you protect the rights of humans, and environmental protection, where you protect the environment. But the environment is always somehow detached from humans. It's always something that is other from humans. And the basic, you know, philosophical underpinning of our idea is that we are part of this ecosystem. We are protecting the earth and, and, and our, you know, local ecological uh, constituencies because we are part of it. So th that is a major, as I was saying, a major uh, philosophical change. And this, uh, we think this is very important because uh, maybe, you know, not everyone is aware of that. I have... Um wrote something actually a little bit of time ago that um, some people is actually thinking that this COVID situation was needed because the earth needed a break from us, you know, yeah, just a breakout. The world is breaking up from us and uh, this crisis was kind of needed. So can we like think or rethink the relationship with the, between humans and nature thanks to this situation? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it was needed or not, but of course, sometimes you need situations which are challenging because if everything is the same and people live in their, in their comfortable way of living, it's very difficult for people to make a change. In a way, this was it, it might be useful, as I was saying, because it's a time where people are forced to to think maybe a bit more in depth about the current situation. It was very interesting um, to see that uh, you know the, the the satellite data and the satellite um, photos that show that for the first time maybe in many many decades the a, the air quality in areas like the uh, Pianura Padana, like the Milan area, was much cleaner than it usually is. Of course, we, we, we could have expected that because we had the data showing that this was one of the most polluted areas in Europe. And we have satellites now that are measuring that. But now we have actually the evidence that if you slow down our yeah. you know, uh, carbon-based economy, obviously the quality of the air will improve. And this will, be, will have positive consequences, for example, on on ecosystem and on our human health. 
So this demonstrates, as I was saying, that the two things are related. So if you do something, you do something for nature and you do something for our human health as well. And the two goals can be connected, can be integrated. So in, in a way, this was a good uh, showing the evidence also to people who wouldn't believe that. Or think about, for example, international newspapers and, and, and international um, websites. They have reported a lot about the clean water in Venice. I don't know if everyone saw that. This has been, uh, you know, something very, very popular or on international websites in recent uh, yes. in recent weeks because it's you know uh, seeing the clear water in Venice and uh, you can see fishes and you uh, you know and, and you can see a completely different city and people were thinking this wouldn't be possible again. Yes, and but... in fact, it is possible. You just slow down all the you know the transport. And, and the private transport and the public transport, and this will be possible. Um, so it, it, it's very interesting in, the, in this sense. Yeah, we are actually seeing dolphins uh, in uh, Cagliari Sport. Uh, we are seeing deers uh, in, in the main streets of London. Uh, we are seeing uh, sea lions uh, in Argentina uh, in, in the streets. Um, you radio is actually asking another question um is this the first time we have to take action not because the for of financial issues but due to a huge health crisis because our beloved dolphins have magically reappeared as well yes yes no no it, it, it's important of course this uh, the, the, COVID, uh, the COVID emergency will also bring about a, a, a financial crisis. But, uh, of course, it is interesting that uh, for, for the first time in many years, we do not only talk of that in, in an economic way, from an economic perspective. Of course, this has economic consequences, but it is not, it is primarily a, an health issue. Is primarily an issue which is uh, is related to the relationship between humans and the rest of, of nature, of animals, of, of, for example, what you were saying is very interesting. You know, the, the, imagine if um, we we can see the, the tip of the iceberg. We can see wild animals reappropriating spaces near the cities or in the cities. But imagine what what does it mean that we are actually refraining from exploitation in wild areas maybe yeah. for a few months and this is an incredible you know positive news for for, for these wild yeah. areas that have been destroyed or or, or at least uh, severely affected by human over exploitation so i think this is also an opportunity to think about that yeah, I was actually reading uh, some days ago that this is the first time in years that, that uh, from India you can actually see the Himalaya mountain, which is yes, incredible. Yeah, I also saw some pictures, yeah, 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 the other day, yeah. And they are incredible, though, because due to the pollution uh, factors uh, from India, they couldn't see actually the biggest mountain in the world, uh, but now they can yeah. because everything stopped. Um, we have another question. Uh, Sarv uh, JNY is asking, um, after a million years, which we have been taking advantage of the Earth, the Earth is recovering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is great. Uh, I think, uh, the, and this explains, uh, and, and this is also an evidence that what many, many scholars are thinking is, is true, that, that uh, you know, it's, it's just about our human approach you know it's our human approach that is uh, as major consequences on climate on biodiversity and so on so what we do as i was saying individually and collectively actually plays a big role um because uh, the earth actually will find the, the possibility to recover you know that there is some literature on the so-called sixth mass extinction um, some writers have been writing about that and uh, th the major issue that this will be a problem mostly for humans would be a problem for 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 the major animal species uh, for for some um plants but, but at the end of the day even if we we will cause for example a climatic catastrophe with our growing emissions the earth will not disappear 
the earth will find a way to go on and, and maybe restart somehow, recover. So the problem is created by humans and, and mostly will be a problem of humans. That's why we need to defend our ecosystem for the benefit of, of, of a, a common flourishing of humans and other living entities. And this might be, as I was saying, an opportunity to see the evidence. So I guess now a lot of skeptical people will be convinced that the quality of air can be better, that climate change might be reduced, that, that the quality of water might be better, that we might keep on living uh, as by exploiting less resources, this is actually possible. Of course, it will, we will need some change. We will find some middle ground between the old way and what we are doing now, which is almost nothing. But maybe there, there is some middle ground that we can uh, mm -hmm. find where we can live, uh, you know, well uh, within, the, within the planetary boundaries, to use a, you know, an, a, an expression that is now used by science. Yeah. We do actually have to take action and to, you know, to embrace our responsibilities uh, if we really do want to do something for the Earth. Um, I, I really thank you, Professor, because our time is running out. But I really thank you for your presence here today. Uh, before leaving us, do you have any reading tips? Yes, yes, I have a couple of uh, reading tips. Uh, I, I have um, selected two books, which are actually um, two books that I think many people will not know. That's the reason why I want to point out to these books. And, and uh, um, in fact, you will be surprised that both books are not, not really new. And both books, they have an American origin. Uh, they are from thinkers from the U.S. And this is also to demonstrate to many people that many people think in the United States nobody was thinking about these, these issues. Actually, some of the great thinkers about a new approach between humans and nature were coming from the U.S. and were coming from the Americas. Let's well, say. not, not so, just them. Uh, Jane Fonda was actually arrested, which is one of the greatest act exactly. actors, uh, actresses. It's true, they it's, true it's true. But this is something maybe even, you know, the, 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 let's say the philosophical underpinning, not many people are aware that a yeah. lot of great thinkers about this, they actually came from there. So the first one is um, a, a book which is a, a bit uh, dated, but is one of the basis of this different approach between humans and nature. The author is Aldo Leopold, uh, and the book is called a, county, um, a Sand County Almanac. It's a book that initially was written in 1949, so it's quite old. Uh, it had a, 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 a golden uh, age in the 70s when it was rediscovered when all this began with, with the Earth Day and so on. And yesterday I was reading actually that they just published, there is now a foundation uh, under the name of Aldo Leopold in the US and they just published a 50 years edition uh, and it will be very interesting. It, it's a book about the relationship between humans and nature, which was the starting point for a lot of reflections, first in the States and then all over the world. And the second book is also by a great thinker um, who was active in the U.S. It's a book uh, dated 1999. Um, the author is Thomas Berry, uh, and the book is called The Great Work. Uh, and and it's, it, it, the subtitle is Our Way into the Future. This is also a very interesting book that is um, talking about the, uh, the, the objective of a mutually enhancing human earth relationship so on the basis of the, this book a lot of thinkers have started to work for example on the legal and institutional dimension of, of, of a different relationship between human and, and earth that's why i think these books are very useful they are not books that everyone everybody knows and that's why it might be an opportunity you know to bring them to the to the knowledge of people who didn't yes. come across that that's so. where that also what virtual studio is about. So that's perfect. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your really positive message for us. And, uh, you know, let's follow uh, Jane Fonda and all of these thinkers and take action and respect our planet. Thank you, thank, Professor. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And good luck for the yes. for going on of this uh, very good uh, program.
Thank you so much. Nice Thank evening, you. everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.